So on behalf of myself and Bob Bauer, who is my uh, supremely wise, talented, and collegial co-director uh, of the uh, uh, NYU Law School's Legislative and Regulatory Process Clinic, I wanted to welcome you here today to the fourth year of the Sidley Austin Forum. We are joined this year by another NYU law entity, the Reese Center on Law and Security, a nonpartisan, multidisciplinary institute. Um, and the director, Rachel Goldbrenner, who is here, has been invaluable in helping pull together the program for this afternoon. Now, this forum would not be possible without the generous support of Sidley Austin, a renowned international law firm. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Rosscam, who is a partner in Sidley's Chicago office, who knows a lot about what we're talking about today. He served his district in Illinois in the U.S. House of Representatives for six terms from 2007 to 2019. And during that time, he held a number of very significant positions. One of those most pertinent to what we're talking about today is that he chaired the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Oversight, which is where he championed efforts that were supported on a bipartisan basis to overhaul the IRS's civil asset forfeiture program. Peter, come say hello. Well, Sally, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and on behalf of my partners at Sidley Austin, it's a joy for us to participate and to be sponsoring today's event, so thank you very much. And it's also a joy to have met many of the students who are here, and front row people, um, and to interact with you and to get a sense of where you are and um, what your experiences have been. Um, thank you for taking the time to introduce yourselves to me. My predecessor in office was Henry Hyde, who served in the US House of Representatives for 32 years. And he had a great expression that I've appropriated, and it's this. He said, there's one thing worse than gridlock. The worst thing than gridlock is the greased shoot of government. And today, what we're hearing about is this natural tension that our founders contemplated between two branches that are really at one another. And our founders, as you recall, had a low view of human nature. They didn't trust human nature. And they created these branches to be in perpetual tension with one another. And now, the, the news today with the impeachment in, uh, moving forward out of the Judiciary Committee, it's uh, with no sense of irony, then, that uh, there's an announcement that the House is cooperating with the administration on the passage of uh, the up updated NAFTA, USMCA. So therein lies, I think, the tension, the brilliance of the founders, and this is a system that we're the beneficiaries of. So on, on behalf of my partners at Sidley, we're really honored to participate here today. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. So today's program is called Constitutional Questions in Political Struggle, Congress's Role in Oversight and National Security. We have a lot of ground to cover, and for that reason, our introduction of the speakers who will be at this podium or in the chairs uh, will be exceedingly brief. There are full biographical information in your programs that you should have received when you arrived. Also, throughout the day, we will be taking questions from the audience. You were given cards if you wanted them when you came in. We'll have students from NYU who will be along the two sides and will collect the cards. If you want new cards, additional cards, raise your hand. Uh, please write legibly. That will be uh, exceedingly important. And pass them to the aisles where they'll be collected and brought down here. As you know, we had to rearrange the schedule somewhat, and so let's go to it. Bob? Bob? Yes, you're on. <laughs> Will you do the honors of introducing our first panel? 
So you have a program with uh, the appropriate biographical backgrounds. I'll just say very briefly, on my left is Kathy Rumler, who is the head of the Global White Collar Defense and Investigations Group at Latham and Watkins, has a, served in two White House counsel's offices, including the one in which I served. She was uh, my deputy from 2009 to 2011, and then for another three years as uh, President Obama's White House counsel, she will tell you the years when she was my deputy were the most rewarding of her professional <laughs> life. That's true, is it not? Of course. So, in any <laughs> and she does not answer questions that she does not wish to give the answers to. As, and she uh, has a rich experience with the topics that we are going to be discussing today, which is an examination from a broad institutional perspective of uh, Congress's role in oversight of national security. On her left is Don McGahn. Uh, he is a partner at Jones Day. He is in charge of their uh, government relations and uh, government uh, representation practice. I've known him for many years. He was a chairman and for many years a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission. He was a general counsel to the National Congressional Campaign Committee in the course of which we also uh, came to know each other uh, in, on very friendly terms. And we also, um, and you, as you well know, he was a White House counsel to uh, President Trump uh, for, a, I guess, extended period of time until a couple of years. Couple of years. And Don will join us now in a conversation about uh, the White House counsel view of the issues that we're going to be discussing today in congressional oversight, uh, war powers, uh, the discharge of its constitutional role. And I'm going to ask them at the very end, I'm going to let you now, to, to give us, leave us with a few questions at the very end that I in turn hope that we can ask Senator Lee and Congressman Krishnamurti when they arrive later. But let's begin. First Kathy, then Don. Fundamental question. So I was watching uh, a presentation that Senator Lee gave uh, to the National Constitutional Center, and he stated that Congress's failures in these areas are the biggest constitutional problem of our time. Uh, I'm sorry. Senator Lee, in his presentation to the National Constitution Center, stated that he thought that congressional oversight failures, congressional failure to assert its role, constitutional role in oversight and national security was the largest constitutional issue of our time. From a White House perspective to begin with, what are the challenges for making that relationship between Congress and the executive work? One of the biggest challenges is managing leaks. So um, one of the things, particularly in the national security context, that uh, you have to deal with at, at the White House when you're briefing members on you know, all sorts of sensitive things, sometimes operational things that haven't yet happened, is a, is a concern over leaks. And not just because people don't like leaks of national security information, but because um, leaks of, of certain types of information can have very serious operational and you know, potentially catastrophic consequences. And so I don't say that to disparage um, another branch of government, but rather, uh, you know, hist if history, if we learn anything from history, is that the more people that you um, share information with, uh, the more likely it is that, that information will find its way into the public. And I think most executive branch officials would say that, um, you know, leaks from the Hill are a big problem. So that that is. Uh, one of the things is so structuring, you know, how you um, keep the Congress informed. At what level do you um, do you brief an entire committee? Let's say the Senate Intel Committee or the House Intel Committee. Do you brief the leadership? Do you brief the leadership and the committees? You know, those are the types of um, conversations and deliberations that I think all White Houses have. I'd be interested to see whether Don had those. When, and you're trying to evaluate kind of how sensitive the information is with how broadly you can responsibly um, distribute it while also making sure that the appropriate congressional you know, committees and, and overseers are informed. And before I ask Don to give you or give all of us his view, and that would address sort of concerns you have about congressional role in national security decision making. What about domestic oversight? Any particular challenge you would identify there? 
Gosh, where do I begin with that? Um, so on the domestic side, there there is um, always, I think, in any administration, a, a real push and pull between the White House and um, and the Congress, between the administration, first of all, but with the White House in particular, around congressional oversight. So Congress, um, and particularly when one chamber of Congress is controlled by the opposite party, is very interested in getting internal White House documents. Um, the White House is very interested in ensuring that those White House documents remain confidential and within the executive branch, and that is kind of a longstanding um, push and pull that has been going on you know, for decades. And the, from the White House Counsel's Office perspective, and when you, you might say, well, why is it that a White House cares so much about keeping internal White House communications confidential, the reason is, is that, um, and this is, this is both the, the real world reason, um, part of the real world reason is, is that nobody wants to have their emails strewn all over you know, the front page of the Washington Post. But um, another real world reason is, is that if the president's most senior advisors and those who are engaging with the president um, on a day-to-day -day basis about the important decisions that a president is facing, have um, a concern that their communications as reflected in internal documents will be provided you know, in real time or virtual real time um, to the public or, or to the Congress that it will essentially chill the advice that the president gets. And that is a, that is a very practical, real concern. I've, I've seen it happen in, in real life where people start to, to give advice to the president differently because if their true views were known to the outside world, they would get you know, pilloried by this particular constituents group or this particular media outlet or whatever. So um, guarding those internal White House communications um, from oversight is, I think, a, a primary responsibility and, frankly, a primary imperative of virtually every White House counsel. Don? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, as I recall the question, I think the, the simple answer, which is not necessarily the most correct answer, is when it comes to oversight, particularly of foreign affairs and international issues, um, most assume it really depends the party, comp the party composition of the White House versus the House versus the Senate. And if it's all the same party, it's, it's easy. If it's not the same party, it's hard. Certainly true, much easier if it's all the same party, I think. Much harder if it's not the same party. But when it comes to national security and foreign affairs, things do not necessarily break down on strictly partisan lines. There is, there is a real constitutional issue buried in there where um, the executive certainly has the view that they have uh, that he, he or she has tremendous uh, authority under the Constitution over foreign affairs, commander-in-chief of the military and the like. Um, <laughs> Congress tends to say they have oversight, um, and they ultimately, particularly the House, has the power of the purse. So a lot of this back and forth and tug of war actually sounds in constitutional uh, principles, and that doesn't necessarily know party, party lines uh, because each side of the aisle has folks who don't necessarily fit in with their uh, colleagues' view of what the mainstream view of the Constitution is. So you have, on the Republican side, you have folks who actually uh, uh, think the executive branch does have a big say. Others are very suspicious of concentrated power, various range in between. So it's always an interesting uh, uh, juggling act. Um, uh, and uh, you do have the decision from time to time as to who knows what and when uh, and the, the modern convention that's developed is the idea of leadership and the chair and ranking of the various intel committees, that they are sort of on the tree of trust and, and can be read in in a way that's not going to, not going to necessarily spread. The thing that you have also have to keep in mind, I always did, is that House members are elected. Senators are elected by the people. They represent the sovereign people of their states and, and districts. So, you know, they, they do have a right to know some things, but then you come back to the constitutional authorities, uh, which raises, you know, pr maybe it's the next question, but what exactly is oversight? Does Congress have oversight over 
decisions the president makes that are clearly within his executive authority, executive branch, what are they overseeing at that point uh, if it is actually a power that the Constitution gives to the president? So these are the sort of discussions that one has with, with various uh, elected officials and staff. Some are more willing to have that discussion <laughs> than others, but it is always a challenge, and it's not as easy as simply saying what's the partisan composition of each chamber at a given moment. Let me pick up on the question you just asked about whether oversight um, is within Congress's sort of purview, it's Congress's authority to pursue, where there's some question of whether the president has exclusive Article II authority. Kathy, at the end of the Clinton administration, there was controversy over the pardons that he issued right before leaving office. And Congress did conduct uh, oversight, uh, not only conducted oversight, but I believe, and I don't know whether it was the last White House counsel to actually appear on a sort of negotiated basis to give testimony. Uh, I think White House counsel Beth Nolan did in the pardon matter. Can you talk a little bit about how the White House kind of addresses this whole question because it gets us into the whole matter of accommodation the question of whether or not they are in some way through the oversight exercise, as Don suggested, conceivably infringing on the president's constitutional duties. Right, and of course, a footnote to that, there was actually the Justice Department opened an investigation um, as well, and not, not through a special counsel, but the Justice, the Southern District of New York uh, opened a criminal investigation into, those, into um, the president's exercise of his pardon authorities. Um, it would be interesting to see, go back and look at what some of the commentary was around uh, that at the time, but I digress. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, it, it, that is a very difficult question, and I think that um, certainly most presidents would take the view that that is beyond the purview is of um, the legitimate exercise of Congress's uh, oversight authority. And uh, those of you who have had occasion to read um, Letters over, you know, again, many administrations, you'll often see reference to um, this term legitimate that uh, executive branch officials use to, um, to, to sort of push back on the limits of what Congress can appropriately exercise oversight of. I think that the Congress would say, well, um, the power of the purse, which is clearly within um, Article I authorities is quite expansive. And, you know, we frankly fund the executive office of the president, and that allows us to, to exercise, you know, basically have sort of unfettered review. And that's kind of an ongoing debate that, as you mentioned, generally does end up resulting in an accommodation. I think most presidents have made decisions based on um, political judgments about whether or not to make available, for example, in that instance, the White House counsel to provide testimony, notwithstanding the fact that the Justice Department would have been advising the White House that um, the White House counsel was, um, may have been able to assert the doctrine of absolute immunity and um, decline to go and testify. But nevertheless, President Clinton who is now a former president, um, but you know, I think technically Beth testified after he was no longer in office because the, the Mark Rich pardon was on the very last day or second to last day of, the, of um, his time in office. But you know, they, they, they make a judgment about what, what are the optics of not having a senior White House official testify or a former senior White House official testify, how do those optics um, uh, affect the president's political capital and his ability to get other things that he wants to get done, um, his you know if he's in, still has another election, a, you know a re-election, all of these kinds of things come into the mix, and that's where you get into this zone of accommodating, and that's why historically it hasn't happened a lot, but there have been um, senior White House officials who have testified before Congress, notwithstanding the fact that the um, executive branch takes the view that there is a circle of advisors who should be immune from having to provide testimony to Congress. If it is, a, if it is what you refer to as a prudential judgment that reflects both the legal and constitutional position the president takes and what you call optics, yeah. the potential sensitivities, political sensitivities of either 
allowing the testimony or not allowing the testimony. Let me put the question uh, to you, Don, this way. If you are going to be one day teaching White House Counsel School um, and you've got a White House Counsel in front of you, what as a theoretical matter, matter would you say is the role of the White House Counsel where a judgment like that, the one that Kathy described, is not just a legal judgment, right? It's a sort of large institutional political judgment about what in the current circumstances the White House should or should not do to respond to the congressional demand. What's the role of the White House counsel? How does it relate, for example, to the participation in those decisions of other component parts of the White House? Well, I think that if I were teaching White House counsel school, if that were a thing, maybe it should be a thing. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I were teaching White House Counsel School, the first thing you'd have to note is what uh, you note in any sort of legal ethics class or kind of lawyering 101, who is the client? And counsel to the president is the counsel to the president. Uh, and with that comes uh, sort of obligation to always think in terms of the legal authority of the president, authorities under the Constitution, statutes, um, and the like, um, and and it's not a you know it's not a personal lawyer. We all say this. It all sounds pretty easy in the abstract. Um, maybe it's maybe for some it's it's tough to cast in the abstract. But I think for lawyers it's rather easy to sort of say, oh, that doesn't sound that hard. Um, an easier way to explain it to lawyers is if you're representing a corporation. You represent the entity, not a particular CEO or a member of the board or that kind of thing. And I find with lawyers that resonates a little bit better when they say, oh, they think, oh, there was that one time so-and-so on the board really wanted them to do some sort of opinion letter that they could go do something or the CEO wanted to do something and you had to say the bylaws aren't going to permit that. And, you know, the CEO or the board member would be very mad at you for a while, but at the end of the day, you are representing the entity. You may represent the CEO personally. That's a different role than worrying about the institutional concerns. So the first thing at, at, at White House Counsel School would be to sort of discuss who is the client and what that, what that means and what it doesn't mean. Um, the political ramifications of decisions, lawyers are probably not the ones best equipped to, to make those decisions, just as in corporate America, business judgments ought not be made by the general counsel, it ought to be made by the CEO or the board or whatever other mechanism that the, that the uh, bylaws demand. Lawyers can certainly weigh in on what, they are, what their judgment is because all these questions have, uh, eventually become mixed questions of law and politics. But when it comes to the more politically sensitive calculations, I don't think the lawyer ought to be the one deciding those. Uh, and that's true. Um, other, not just White House counsel, but other branches of government. Uh, the Chief Justice has a general counsel, the House has a House counsel, the Senate has a House counsel, uh, Senate counsel rather. The counsel to the Senate started making political, political decisions for the senators. People would think that was, that was way out of bounds. So, you know, I think for White House counsel school purposes, I would, I would keep, I would emphasize the fact that you are, you know, a lawyer kind of for a branch of government um, in a way, just as there's other lawyers and other branches of government who have similar institutional interests that they have to keep in mind when they offer their advice. So to be clear, let me ask you this question, and Kathy, same question to you. So if the, does the lawyer wind up intervening or sort of, if you will, expressing a judgment on a question of, well, I think we ought to do, there, there are significant constitutional problems we have with yielding to this congressional demand, but we ought to do it anyway because there are the following potential political or communications ramifications. Is that a judgment that the White House counsel brings forward in the first instance, if we're now talking to White House counsel school, or is that something the White House counsel offers in the way of opinion only if asked? There's no right or wrong answer. I think it depends on who the White House counsel is, who the president is, what the relationship is, and the nature of the question. I think, I think if it is an issue, even if political, uh, that could then raise a second or third degree legal issue. I think it is the obligation of the lawyer to raise it and say, if you do this, even if you have the authority to do this today, it may put pressure on another part of the analysis tomorrow that'll put you in a, in a legal box. And you see this with the accommodation process. You may, there's, there's, there's times to fold them, times to hold them, you know, and, and you have to think, I think the lawyer's job is to think not just about what, we, what are we doing on Monday and what are we doing on Tuesday, but what's gonna happen Thursday and Friday, not of this week, but even of next week and next month and next year and, and next term in terms thereafter. Uh, and I think that's the modern view of, 
of what the White House Counsel kind of does is help help with sort of the institutional. DOJ still does a large part of that office, le office legal counsel with their opinions and whatnot, very much the institutional knowledge of the executive branch. But the, your real question about how far does the lawyer go, if the lawyer gets into playing political consultant, you cease being a lawyer, and I'm not sure who would then listen to you for legal advice. When I first got the job, I went and met with some of my predecessors that I knew. There was one predecessor in particular who, that was the first thing he told me when he was teaching me White House Counsel School. I'll give you a hint which one it was. Uh, <laughs> Kathy, your thoughts about oh, I, if I, asked or just because you should anyway give um, that kind of advice to the president? I. I agree with what Don said. I think that it's important if you're not asked um, and you feel like for whatever reason it's important to to offer a, a, a view that's more of a political view or an optics view than a legal view, it, it's important to, um, to emphasize to the president and to other members of the staff that that's what you're doing um, so that it can be appropriately discounted by everybody in the room um, if, if, if that's what they you know want to do. So I think um, making sure that you maintain um, your difference, your, because there are lots of people, I think in every White House there are lots of people who um, believe that they have you know political expertise and the best political judgment and can give the president the, the best political advice and it's important that the White House counsel be different than the others in that respect and be offering a perspective that is rooted in um, law and precedent and you know defending the institution. Don brought up the Office of Legal Counsel the Department of Justice and the relationship between the White House counsel and the Office of Legal Counsel has obviously been a subject of recurrent comment and controversy on the issues that we're talking about. Right? Boundaries of constitutional authority, whether or not privileges can be appropriately asserted and so forth. What weight, well, well, I'll ask the question in two parts. To what extent does the White House Counsel feel that that is an opinion that the White House Counsel has to have, as opposed to, for example, the White House Counsel reaching his or her own opinion on the subject? Uh, and what weight, if that opinion is acquired, does the Office of Legal Counsel's judgment on those issues carry, or should they carry? I ask that question because there's obviously been this view that the White House Counsel, a view, it's not the only view, that the White House Counsel is too close to the president, represents the president, though institutionally, also at very close quarters in a personal sense as well, and that the only way for this constitutional order to be properly policed is to have an independent body of specialists, like in the Office of Legal Counsel, weigh in on these issues. How much, how much of a role do you think the White House Counsel is obligated to afford the Office of Legal Counsel on the kind of questions that we're talking about here? I'll go first, I'll, why not? Um, there's an executive order that's been around for quite a while that states the Office of Legal Counsel is the authoritative view of the executive branch. So until a president rescinds that executive order, the White House Counsel has to follow the executive order and that, that is the authoritative view of the executive, executive branch, which sounds like that answers the question fully, but it does not, because I think really baked into your question are two different situations. One is interagency executive branch legal issues. Uh, OLC is, per this executive order, the final legal word. So if, if the general counsel of agency A thinks the law is whatever they want to think it is, and agency B's general counsel disagrees and thinks that it's something else, and it's something where they essentially have overlapping or, or very similar jurisdictions, somebody has to referee that. And when push comes to shove, it's actually the Office of Legal Counsel who is the authoritative thing. Now, White House Counsel tends to be the more informal referee, um, and you try to work things out, you know, as your own accommodation process, so to speak, where you actually end up, um, at least with legal questions, people look to the White House Counsel as the person to kind of break the tie. Second set of issues is actually core presidential authority that the president wants to do something. You're not talking about cabinet officials fighting amongst themselves. And I think that gets trickier because, because that is um, uh, something, again, baked into the Constitution. Article One is one of enumerated powers. The Congress has a list of things they can do. The president, executive power is the executive power, whatever that means. We've been, we've been debating that for over 200 years now. So there's a lot of there's a lot of 
ways that that can go, depending on who uh, is uh, sitting in the Oval Office making the decision. Uh, and you know, various presidents have had views of the Constitution. Taft as well, well written and well spoken over the years. And having been Sixth Circuit Judge, President, Chief Justice, he had a very developed view as president what his authorities were under the Constitution. Right? Other presidents come at it a little more political, a little more cerebral. You know, it, it, everyone brings to the table their own sorts of strengths and, and worldview. And I think, I think uh, when it comes to executive authority, uh, you know, there's no book on the shelf when you get the job of White House counsel. You take it off and say, okay, here's, here's the things the president can and can't do. Hundreds of years of precedent. Well, and I think just to build on that, there certainly is no obligation on behalf of the White House counsel to seek an opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel. And so whether or not to do that and in what circumstances to do that um, is, is always an important question. And um, because if you, in fact, then get the opinion, then you're going to be, that's the opinion. So, um, so I think a, a lot of times White House counsels will think about when is it appropriate to consult with OLC, you know, um, so sort of in a be careful what you wish for type of dynamic. And um, I think traditionally, uh, White House counsels have gone to OLC when they feel like the president is going to take a, um, a controversial action or something that you know doesn't have clear precedent, and it would be helpful to legitimize the validity of the action to have a formal OLC opinion um, behind it. And you know, so but there are lots of decisions that are made about presidential authority, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis that OLC is not consulted on, much less, um, you know, offers a formal opinion. Okay, so let's talk about <clears throat> the the question of whether, therefore, the deck is completely stacked within the White House in a way that has the president overreaching if you will, on executive authority issues and crowding the Congress out or putting pressure on the Congress uh, that doesn't square with our notions of what the relationship should be. You have a small piece of real estate, which is the West Wing. The White House counsel is there as a senior aide along with the director of communications and the press secretary and whoever political advisors have to be present and so forth. And one argument is that the White House counsel therefore becomes co-opted into a political operation that by virtue of the way the modern presidency operates means that the White House counsel is going to be under tremendous pressure to expand and defend the expansive, most expansive potential boundaries of executive authority. It has led some critics to say there ought not to be a White House counsel. There ought to be some distance between the lawyers and the White House the White House should be where it is on Pennsylvania Avenue, and the Department of Justice ought to be where it is on Constitution Avenue. Is that a practical, is there, is there an answer to that? Start with Kathy, go to Don. Well, I think it's, uh, I think what your answer is may depend on what your view of presidential authority is. <laughs> so, you know, one on one extreme, if you think that the president's, um, you know, executive authorities are, are largely, um, legally unconstrained, but are constrained only by political constraints, meaning that whatever Congress can do through its oversight authorities or, or appropriation authorities or, or otherwise, that's, that's one set of ways in which um, a president's actions can be curtailed. Uh, another way is obviously just through uh, the ballot box and voters deciding that a president has overreached. And another way is, is when presidential action gets challenged in court and the, and the courts rein it in. So, you know, one view would be, well, why, okay, given that, you've got those three checks on um, a president's exercise of his authority, you know, why in the world shouldn't the White House counsel be um, there just um, to facilitate what the president wants to do? which in his view he's authorized to do until someone tells him he's not, right? I, I, don't, I don't, it's not necessarily a position I would agree with, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a rational, reasonable position that you know, has some um, grounding in the Constitution. Um, an alternative would be that, that the White House counsel has to, to play some role of a governor that had the, the White House counsel has an independent um, obligation to uh, 
to exercise, you know, some restraint on the president to sort of act with, put some guardrails around the president. Now, whether or not that's because you believe um, that that's just a good thing for a lawyer to do, which is sort of separate than the question you're asking, <laughs> right? Which is, it's in the president's interest for him to have somebody who's saying, boy, geez, I wouldn't do that, because if you do that, it's gonna be a train wreck, versus actually thinking that there is an obligation on behalf of um, the White House counsel to act as sort of an independent check. I'm not sure, with some exceptions, and I think I know one that you're thinking about, some academic exceptions, I'm not sure you would find a practicing lawyer who actually would argue that you know someone who is appointed by the president, who d has not gone through the Senate confirmation process, um, has a, an independent obligation other than what they have just by you know being a government employee and having an oath to the Constitution, um, is there to check a president's exercise of authority. Don? Is there such an independent obligation? The White House counsel takes an oath too. Um, you have an obligation to the Constitution. Why in some circumstances wouldn't the White House counsel be an advocate for congressional responsibility in some circumstances? Say that again, you lost me. <laughs> well, if, if the White House counsel I was ready to go in the question you had asked, and now you hit me kind of with a variant, so I have to retool. Yeah, yeah, I, well, I, I put a little body English on that. Why don't we go ahead and answer the uh, question? I'll just talk. How about yeah, that? Yeah, let's do it. That let's way do it. I let's can, let, that I way can say I just didn't really answer the question, because this is Washington, D.C., and right, that's what we And I'll do. call you on it, right. I'll call you, you on will. that, okay. Um, my reaction to your question was, was to say the Department of Justice is not in the Constitution. Um, and what I mean by that is the idea that there be some quasi-independent check on the president's authority that sort of extra-constitutional strikes me as something that would be extra-constitutional. Um, DOJ has not been around since the founding. Uh, you know, it, it really goes back not that long, uh, and it's very much a 20th century creature. Um, so I also think in response to your question, which is kind of a non-response response, is Watergate changed everything. Prior to Watergate, um, I think it's safe to say that the Attorney General was viewed as the President's lawyer. Um, I think the President certainly thought of that. I certainly think um, uh, this explains why President Kennedy had his brother as AG, and although there were people who sort of grimaced apparently at the end of the day, that's still proper. Because um, it's expected that the AG would be working for that President. Um, Watergate changed all this. Um, and then what we see have happened is DOJ has become gradually more independent. Congress did toy with the idea of making DOJ independent of the president. That did not pass, even in, the, even in the height of concern over what was going on in the executive branch. This town still could not come to the point where they said we need an independent DOJ, independent of the president. And I think White House counsel, in a lot of ways, as DOJ has become more independent of the White House, has filled that gap with legal analysis that kind of fits into to what would otherwise be, be a vacuum. Um, my third reaction is what every lawyer reacts to every question was it, it depends on the nature of the question. If it is a question uh, where you know you're going to be in tension with the legislative branch and it is a close call and it's a shared power, many are, I think your job as White House counsel is to make the legal argument on behalf of Article II. Um, so I, I'm not sure the duty of counsel is to, is to rein in the power under Article II in a situation where Article I uh, has tools at its disposal to, to fight the fight. We like to think of these fights sometimes as these mega big policy or legal fights. 99% of the argument that goes on behind closed doors are very small fights over, over how we move a particular rule or policy and then what, you know, so it's not the sort of stuff that most people end up caring about or gets in the newspapers, but whatever approach one takes as a lawyer, it has to be consistent where the smallest issues and the largest issues, you at least kind of call the balls and strikes in the stream, strike zone, so you have to be kind of consistent. What I always found was tricky is, is I'm one, and I think lawyers fall into one of three categories in this town. You're either sort of an Article I person or an Article II person, or you're made to be on the bench. I cut my teeth much more um, uh, on the, in the legislative side, representing a lot of elected legislators um, as outside counsel for the House Administration Committee for a while, you know, so they did some oversight, 
And then lo and behold, now I'm the counsel to the president in Article Two. So I, I had sort of played I had sort of played the lawyer role on both sides of this sort of thing. So I came at it with a, probably a little bit different view than some, not all, of my predecessors, where I, I was very much able to think. How, is art, how are the Article I lawyers doing oversight going to think about this and sort of take, take the analysis more that direction as opposed to this, this sort of, it's a nice academic debate over what the role is and checking and this and all that. But at the end of the day, we have three branches of government and when they crash into each other and fight for their various powers, I see that as a, I see that as a feature, not a bug in our system of government. Meaning that as White House counsel, you help the president fight out, fight for his share of the turf based on a reading of Article Two authority. It's each branch takes care of its own, does its what it must do to defend its own boundaries. Right. Let's let's them. let's say something small that's not that's not really current events. It makes it easier um, uh, to to just not you know because everyone's going to see everything through uh, the lens of today, not. 10 years ago or 10 years from now, but you know, we're trying to do sort of a high you know, thing. Um, uh, I've represented a lot of people in the US Senate. They really love the fact that they have a big say in picking who's on the federal courts. But under the Constitution, the president makes the nomination, the appointment with the advice consent of the Senate. So maybe a question when Mike Leake speaks is, what about all this stuff the Senate has sort of come up with over the years, these institutional Senate prerogatives? that where the Constitution refers to the Senate, but it turns out it's really a subset of the Senate. Is it my job as White House counsel to say, well, you know, the Senate's view is really, you know, I think we should take this seriously. As White House counsel, the view is the president makes the choice, not the senator, right? Now, I'm back to representing many of these senators, so, you know, they, they're going to hate when I say this, but I have to get in trouble with somebody here today. So... Um, you know, there's issues like that that come up, and that is something that is not, uh, you know, it's not, it's not foreign affairs driven. It's not the sort of inside baseball that most people care about, uh, but it is something that sounds in the Constitution, and that is a, is a shared power where the Constitution makes clear who the ultimate decision maker is, but then he has to get the advice consent of the Senate. So that's one of these things where, what's the job of the White House counsel? Represent the president's views, no question about it. Not to get check on his views or say, well, you know, uh, you know, the Senate really thinks that it has a larger role than uh, than you think, sir. No, that's not that's not your job at all. You're a lawyer for the president. Well, and I think that that example and what what Don is sort of hinting at is this um, the difference between sort of you know what are the authorities that are grounded in the Constitution and what are the authorities that have developed over time through um, norms and expectations and, um, and, and precedent, basically, right? So Congress has decided that it's going to assert more authority than, than a pure, um, than a presidential lawyer might think that they're entitled to in the context of judicial nominations by doing things that they can do, things like something called the blue slip system, um, which, you know, is a Senate kind of uh, technique that um, gives Senate, uh, senators much more practical um, say over judicial nominations than the Constitution probably, frankly, provides, <laughs> right? But that's a practice and a norm that has developed over um, many years, and there are, you know, kind of... Um, lots of debates in the inside baseball world about whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. And likewise, I think with respect to the you know, notions of Department of Justice independence and how much um, the Attorney General should be independent from the President is another um, thing that falls into the category of a norm. Um, and you know, that what are the expectations of people and how much of, of this is, is basically a product of this dynamic government that we have and a dynamic constitution that um, evolves through learning and through events like Watergate and you know through events like every time we have a, a Supreme Court um, vacancy and nomination process you know we learn something new every time through going through um, that that process the executive learns and the Congress learns and they um, frankly figure out how to gain more power in that process as a result 
before I talk about the interactions with Congress in particular, I just want to push on this last point what, what, with the spin that Don correctly identified I'd put on the earlier question to you about the role of the White House counsel in helping the president think through what authorities and he or she wishes to assert, how far he or she wishes to go. The I take it, Don, that your view, and then I'll put the question to you, Kathy, is that presidents come to office under tremendous pressure to get stuff done. They've made broad promises. There's a huge public expectation with the inauguration of every president. Even in a divided polity, at least half the country has huge expectations about what's going to happen with a newly elected president. And so all of the pressure is for the president to get stuff done. So the result of this, of course, has been ever since you know, Arthur Schlesinger coined the term imperial presence presidency, presidents come in, head of steam, to try to sweep obstacles out of their paths. Does the White House counsel have any obligation to say to the president, you know, you took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Let's talk a little bit about limits. What, 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 what legacy, constitutional legacy, do you want to leave in the development of a relationship that is both functional for you but within constitutional bounds within the Congress? Is that a weird conversation to have, Don? Is that maybe totally unproductive, but I'm asking that question and then Kathy. I think it'd be a weird conversation to have out of the blue, just as if you're, you know, counsel to the Speaker of the House or the Senate leader or, you know, all of a sudden, you know, this, we need to talk kind of thing. I think it's much more organic than that, where it comes up issue by issue, and I think the lawyer does raise, uh, you know, the legal points and the institutional longer term things that if you do this decision today, it may put you in a box tomorrow. It may not be you personally, it may be your successor, it may be you personally. But I'm not sure, um, you know, these sorts of jobs lend themselves to the, the sort of academic nicety type discussions. I think it really depends on the person. I've had, I've had uh, clients, elected official clients, who are very much, actually do want to have the we need to talk moment and they want to sit for hours and debate their view of the Constitution. Other clients I've had don't. They're, they're much more into counting legislative votes and wanting to, wanting to move a piece of legislation. Um, there is a great pressure on presidents to get things done, the whole what's going to happen in the first 100 days and all these sort of arbitrary measures of, of faux success. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just a construct you have to deal with in the modern age, you know. But let's go back again. Constitutionally, the executive power is a very broad power. Uh, and coupled with that, um, Congress has passed a lot of statutes that have moved a lot of power away from Congress to the executive. And uh, they, have, they have given the executive quite a bit of power. Um, you know, let's take a hypothetical we need to talk. The taxing power belongs to Congress. It's in Article I. If you keep reading the taxing power, it gets into duties, tariffs, and that sort of thing. Tariff is a form of a tax, I guess, right? The Constitution, that's what it looks like. But there's a number of statutes that allow the president to impose tariffs. Uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. So when, when people in Congress howl that a president may be, may be doing this, that, or the other with tariffs, the statute authorizes the president to do it dead stop. Uh, it, it's, it's right there. Now, is it the lawyer's job to say, well, personally, you know, I remember in law school I wrote this paper where I thought maybe this statute, you know, okay, I may run for the Senate and repeal the statute if that's your personal view. But as a lawyer, that's the Congress gave the authority. So when 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 Congress says, "Oh, well, you know, you're going too far," it's their own statute. And there's, there's it's not just I'm using that kind of as a as a hypothetical, you know, current event. There's a number of these statutes throughout that have been passed over decades that have shifted a lot of what would otherwise be power that Congress thinks it has over to let the president do it for purposes of efficiency or swifter decision making whole host of good government reasons, uh, situational political reasons of the day, you name it, it's happened. Um, but, you know, this is why these questions about, you know, these various authorities are really tricky to answer in the abstract because the branches, in a lot of ways, have either worked this out, modern norms create sort of understandings as to who's supposed to do what. Um, and, you know, that, that's, again, kind of where we are in the modern age. Kathy, when you answer that question, it occurred to me, and I don't want to get into any specifics of particular decisions that have been made, but it, I'll speak about this abstractly. It was widely reported that on a national security decision that President Obama 
could have made and certainly have sustained, meaning would have made that decision and certainly would not have been seriously challenged. Congress wouldn't have caught off funding. Or maybe somebody would have filed articles of impeachment, but not many, and there wouldn't have been much momentum behind an impeachment process. And you advised he shouldn't, yeah. and he didn't. Could? What's up with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, what's up with that? Up? In light of the conversation <laughs> we're having, what's up with that? Yeah. Um, well, it, I think there are certain circumstances in which you may, as a White House counsel, conclude and advise the president he has the authority to do something, but that, um, that maybe he shouldn't. And this was one example, or there was one example um, that we're not getting into specifics of, but where I, I thought um, that the decision was, there was enough question, um, and I would say there was substantial question about whether or not it was actually within the president's authority to do a particular thing, that it would be, um, he would be better served by getting the Congress to agree with that decision, and so to actually seek congressional authorization. That was not um, an obligation on his part, but in my view, it was, was a prudential thing for him to do to put what was inevitably going to be a controversial thing on sort of sounder footing. So um, ultimately, it was his decision if he chose, or if the president chose that he, to go ahead and exercise the authority, of course, I would have defended it vigorously. Um, and believed again that he had the authority to do it, but um, you know that that it again would be would be viewed as more legitimate if the Congress also um, concurred in it. You know what's interesting. I think just getting back to your question about you know whether there's a time to sit down and say with the president. You know, let's say in the first six months of of um, his first term in office. You know, do you have a constitutional vision? I think that for for most presidents, that becomes more of a historical analysis. People sort of look look at it, a, a president's tenure in office, and say, okay, is there a the theory here? Is there kind of a an Article II um, coherent vision that is more um, you can piece it through in retrospect through looking at individual actions, which may actually reveal a president's preferences and perspectives on this, which very likely evolve over time, right? Uh, you know, a president may come into office and have a very robust view of Article I versus Article II, and, you know, once they're in the seat, and they've been in the seat for six months, you know, they start to feel a little bit differently about it. And, um, and so, you know, I think President Obama, for example, not to get into s specifics, but, um, you know, he actually, you know, did take time um, at you know different moments and different moments of reflection to say, okay, you know, what have we done in terms of his exercise of his constitutional authorities and and sort of what is there left to do and 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 how do I, the president, think about that in kind of a coherent way? I my my sense is that that's pretty atypical, and even then that didn't happen very often. It was much more a product as Don says, of these, you know, individualized decisions and individualized facts and circumstances based on, you know, what was happening in that day and that week and that month. So I want to clarify what seems to be, I wouldn't say a difference between you and Don, but you were a, a, an issue that's raised for me by the answer you just gave, which you said in that situation where there was a question of authorities, but it probably could have been within his authority, he would have been better served by having congressional engagement, and it would have been viewed as more legitimate. Those were the two. And my question to you is, and I want Don to comment on it, if Don is right, that if it's something that policy dictated would be the best action for him to take, why is he better served by not taking it if he knows that for all practical purposes he can get away with it? Whose legitimate view are you concerned about here and then I want Don to comment on that. I mean, why wouldn't the White House counsel just say, oh, well, don't worry about it. I mean, you know, yeah, maybe there's a question here, but if it's the best policy, go ahead. Congress may complain publicly, but it's not going to do anything about it. You're not going to be impeached for it. But it sounded to me like there was, in that prudential response you gave, there was, you know, a touch here of concern that as a legacy matter, however you want to characterize it, just would be better if 
he restrained himself. And I want you to clarify that and let Don respond. Yeah, and I think when I say better, I don't mean in the abstract. I mean that there would be, um, that, that it would have more public legitimacy, meaning the public would be more um, supportive of the decision if the people's representatives were lockstep with the president on that decision, right? So that's what I mean by that. Um, so, and, and when there are questions about, and, and there, these come up you know, pretty frequently, whether or not a president, particularly in the national security space, can take unilateral action, unilateral you know, kinetic action, do something that would be considered sort of an act of war, um, you know, is it, should um, the president go ahead and do that unilaterally? Let's just, it, let's just say, you know, people say he, he's got the authority to do it, but there's always a question about whether or not the president has the unilateral authority to do it. Um, would he, is he better served by getting Congress to agree, right? So if you look at, let, let's just take, um, the authorization for the use of military force that was passed right in the wake of 9-11, days, what, weeks after 9-11. I would argue that uh, the actions that were taken by President Bush, um, kinetic action to target terrorists, were more legitimate in the eyes of the public because he had the congressional authority to do so. I'm sure that President Bush and his lawyers would have taken the position that he didn't need it, but he had it. And that's really what I'm talking about, right? So that everyone says, yes, you have this authority and you can use it. Makes me think of the war power. Let's maybe go past more bipartisan history, war powers resolution. Um, it's one of these things that you, unless you really pay attention or everybody in the room pays attention, so everybody probably already knows this, but whenever there is something that happens that the War Powers Resolution requires the executive to submit, submit paper to Congress, it all says the same thing. It's being done consistent with the War Powers Resolution. It's never pursuant to. No executives conceded the, 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 the legitimacy of the War Powers Resolution, but they've all submitted paperwork consistent with it. Um, so this is not something that just happens today or yesterday or last week or last administration. Or this has been something that's been with us for a long, long time in a variety of areas, particularly when it comes to, to foreign affairs. Look, to the extent you can get Congress on your side, that's just smart. That's just, I mean, it doesn't take, doesn't take a lawyer to know that, right? Um, uh, sometimes you have to go it alone. Sometimes you have to, have to get the support when you can get it. And I think every lawyer runs into situations where you may be able to do it, but then it would help if you maybe did this, that, or the other. And this is not only in big issues, but small ball things, right? I mean, you know, somebody wants to do, do it would really help if you maybe had a couple extra pieces of backup before you went off and put that in your white paper because, you know, yeah, that's an opinion, but maybe, you know, you could, you could do that because it turned it, you know, and I'm thinking more in, 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 in taking it completely out of White House counsel role, more in political lawyer role, right? A lot of things politicians can do but it's going to look bad and it's going to raise questions, right? So you probably, yeah, that maybe that is a fundraiser, but, you know, there's not really enough people. And I, I'm going to have trouble defending that. Maybe you should have, like, more people in the room, you know? Like, you don't have to. I can't point to a law that says, but it's just smart. It'll be a lot easier to, to make the case that this is fine if you do it the way I'm suggesting. Lawyers do this all the time. Uh, Sometimes, though, it's at times where things really matter, and, and you know, it gets into the use of force and, and things that are that are very, very tricky uh, because of the consequences. You know, but again, my point is, as a lawyer, you have to you have to try to have some consistency where how you recommend and advise on small decisions is consistent with how you recommend and advise on the big decisions, uh, and it can't be uh, you can't all of a sudden uh, be somebody you're not uh, just because the stakes are higher. Okay, let's now go to from sort of process and sort of high constitutional deliberation to just the practical difficulties with dealing with politicians in the Congress. Okay. So the, the standard response from former White House counsels who are assailed for the president's failure to engage productively with the Congress is, and I wouldn't say all White House counsels, and I'm not speaking for everybody here, I'm just saying one hears it. They're just impossible to deal with. 
They don't want to take responsibility for their actions. They would prefer to complain publicly while privately leaving the hard difficulties to the executive. And so they delegate, sometimes formally delegate the responsibility when it's abused. They don't rescind the delegation. They don't police the delegation. Or alternatively, they don't delegate, but they also don't act to protect their constitutional equities because they want it both ways. They want to be able to put it on the executive, but at the same time, you know, either allow the executive, maybe opposition parties are less inclined to do this, to claim credit for success, but certainly they want to distance themselves from hard decisions. Okay, I know this isn't fa fair critique, and how much of a, how much of a, you, like the, uh, you, you uh, how the Senate does its procedures? Pardon me? I mean, the Senate's designed to avoid voting on most things, right? right? It's unanimous consent. If you want to talk about sort of putting something off, <laughs> Every branch has its moves, per curiam opinions, right? We all have our, our moves. I think, um, uh, you know, it, it, I guess is, we'll move from White House Counsel School to just representing politician school. Um, <laughs> I've never run from office, I never will. I, I, I always remember it takes a lot of courage. Certain kind of person looks themselves in the mirror and say, I'm gonna stand before voters and I think I get more votes than the other person. Um, and there's a certain, it brings a certain kind of personality and a certain kind of confidence that most of the rest of us lack. Um, so it, it's a certain skill set to represent that kind of, that kind of individual. Um, for me, uh, you know, I, and, and Bob and I have this in common, we've represented elected officials, you longer than I, but for many, many, many years. We, we don't have to bring age into um, this, okay. Um, I got left back one year. <laughs> um, uh, and there's, you know, certain ways of doing it. So to me, it wasn't, you know, I hate to say that it, that that was not really that big a deal because I'd represented so many other politicians. So I, I, I grew up in a political household. I had an uncle who was a state senator, another uncle who did advance for Bobby Kennedy in 68, was in California in June of 68. Um, so I grew up in the game. So for me, this is all normal. Um, I'm used to sort of being around, you know, political decisions and that kind of thing. Lawyers who come out of a more refined, kind of big law, white shoe world where they're sort of doing memos all the time and that sort of thing, I think it's a much co bigger culture shock to come in and sort of speak language, you know, sp speak a language that is accepted by the, by the, the, the folks who actually run for office. But, uh, you know, I've always tried to uh, with clients, you know, try to maintain candor, and I think I think that continues to the present day. Where, if anything, I'm known for sort of mutual candor uh, with clients. Other people, a little more, you know, polished perhaps, and 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 gun shy. But there's a certain knack that you, I think you develop as a lawyer. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, you always have to remember that this this person's won an election. It's not them. They represent people. People voted for this person, and you know that that deserves a certain level of of, of uh, analysis, understanding, uh, and and a certain certain way to present your whatever your point of view is on the law. Always has to be read through the lens that this is not just advising, you know, Corporation X on, on how they can you know do a public offering of stock. It's a different thing. It, it's 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 a it sounds in something very big to me, which is sort of our self-government. Well, but before I turn it to Kathy, then it's because you know, that was a very diplomatic response. Uh, is it fair to say that it's at least a challenge to manage this or to advise these matters that affect presidential and congressional relations if there are strong political disincentives for Congress to assert its role? Sure. Okay. Yeah. How that manifests itself in particular cases, that's a, that's a whole law review article in and of itself, but that's always, that's part of the fun. Fun. <laughs> okay. Kathy? Uh, I'll be less diplomatic. Um, because I, I, I did not come from that world and came, you know, much more from speaking about if you're an Article One person, Article Two. I was very, very squarely an Article Two person and came, you know, from a Justice Department background and, and um, so, very much used to dealing with, you know, things like facts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, deal, it's like dealing with the Hill all the time. It's just absolutely maddening. I remember, um, you know, ha having, this is early on, early on in my, in my tenure, and we had a, a judicial nominee who um, we felt was really wonderful judicial nominee, actually someone who 
was nominated um, by the president when you were still White House counsel, but then I was uh, taking over to try to get this person through. And uh, you know, going up and talking to senators and having a conversation uh, with one senator in particular who was on the Judiciary Committee, and he said, you know, Kathy, you know, she's just, she's absolutely, she's, she's spectacular. <laughs> totally qualified, great, I've met with her, I think she's amazing, not gonna support her. And so, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that um, you, you have to, to, to deal with is, is figuring out how do you, um, okay, I've put this, for this person forward, you don't have any issue at all with the candidate, none. You, act, in fact, think the candidate is fantastic, but you're gonna vote against her nomination. And that's, a kind of, that's what you deal with in Congress. Uh, yeah, but I guess that's where I'm different because the, I would have said that's what you think today. I mean, I had I, many senators. I, I no way can't You didn't, can't you didn't need 60 votes. Thank you very that's much. That's correct. Yes. No, no. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> but you're welcome, Harry Reid. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reid, for that one. Yeah. Well, um, but we could, we could debate that one for a good yeah. 20 minutes. Now, this is going to get exciting, I can tell. <laughs> Where's the debate? <laughs> Mitch McConnell would have changed the rules in a minute. Oh, he could have, should have, would have. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, that, that makes it. I, I don't so think. Reed was just a, a visionary. Ahead I don't. Of his I don't time, think Mitch McConnell needs a permission slip from do. anybody, much less Harry Reid. But anyway. <laughs> Should we go back to high? Uh, no, no. I. I, I it's, now that now, now that now we're getting now that we're getting to street level, it's getting entertaining. We get the time. Right? The guys at the <laughs> front here. Well, let me give you another. Let me give you another example. Time, time limit. Let me give you another example of of um of just that I, I think that you know the, the frustration that um that executive branch people feel often when dealing with the hill. So in another time we, we got summoned got summoned up to the hill, and um, by actually two senators of um two Democratic senators, and. You know, I would say it was kind of like a, a reaming out of uh, why is it, it's me and another senior official, like why is it that the president hasn't been doing the following thing? Um, it's just outrageous, the president should be doing this, et cetera, et cetera. And um, at which point I said, well, the reason why is because you both voted for a bill, you both actually voted for a law that restricted the president's ability to do the very thing that you're now mad at him for not doing. Um, and it was just like blank stares <laughs> back. Um, and I was thinking, well, was, it, was that not in your staff memo? Um, but, but that, you know. I, I would say the answer is probably no to that. That was probably <laughs> not, that was probably not in the read ahead for that meeting for the Probably staff. was not. No. But, um, you know, I think that's, the, it's, th those are two obviously, you know, very small examples, but I, I think are um, indicative of sometimes why uh, people who have worked most just exclusively in the executive branch have frustrations with dealing with folks on the Hill. It happens to all of us. I mean, I, I, not, not to be, you know, I mean, it's, I would have the same kind of meetings and I probably handle them a little differently because everybody has their own way of doing dealing with this, but you do run into this sort of sometimes you realize you passed a law that allows the president to do this or, right. or, or limit it or acknowledge the president has authority in this area, and then you have a bunch of multi-factors trying to limit it. What did you expect the president to do with that? Right. Just, just not, not do it? Um, and so that, that, is, that is tricky. But that illustrates something that I've kind of come back to, which when, when you have these discussions, everyone wants to think about either what's happening today or some big picture thing or you know, every, everything is not some monumental decision that saves or, 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 or kills democracy. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bunch of granular meetings of the sort you say where you're just beating your head against the wall. But this is, is kind of backs me. My point is you're there to represent the president and you have to say this is, you know, this is, well, this is what the president's gonna do. And, and sometimes it was awkward for me because sometimes it'd be people who had been former clients and I'd have to say, I, 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 yeah, I, I know I know what you're saying. I don't represent you today. I'm representing the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue. So, uh, you know, I was fierce when I represented you. Just be just as fierce when I represent the people down the street, yeah. right? And, and I was fortunate in that, that having been around, represented folks, that kind of thing, it never really got to the point where um, it was particularly hostile or, or yeah, I never, I, I don't really, I don't think I ever had a senator blindside me on anything in a meeting, either side of the aisle. I was very fortunate in that I didn't, I was never summoned 
Um, they may have thought they were summoning me, but you know, I would, I, you know, I might just I stop by. Um, uh, you know, you you know, you don't want to be. You, you know, I never felt like anyone was summoning me, uh, at least in the legislative branch, um, uh, to to come to come see them. Um, uh, at least when I was White House, you know what I mean. But uh, it's that's that's a tough part of the job because you do get into these things, and you're as a lawyer, particularly if you're an executive branch sort of Department of Justice sort, you come in and you get your legal analysis, and then you know the member of the legislature just is coming at it from a whole different planet. Um, which is why I said, you know, my next line would be, well, that's what you think today, but my mind would be thinking about, okay, well, you were elected four years ago, and your vote total was this, 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 and I know if I get this, hmm, I know how to get your vote. You know, I just, I came at it from much more of that kind of point of view, particularly yeah. dealing with senators on, on confirmation issues, because that's just, that's not, you know, that's, that's not, uh, you know, polite, you know, you know, tea with the queen, that tends to be raw, you yeah. know, who has the most votes wins kind of stuff. So yeah. you have to think, think that way, um, which was always a challenge for me because I'm much more of an Article One guy than an Article Two guy based upon my, my, in my career in DC, although I've spent my government time mostly in the executive branch. <clears throat> I, I want to commend the two of you. I was occasionally summoned. <laughs> and never for the purpose of bestowing praise on me. Um, so we have a few questions as we conclude here. Um, one question, the executive branch has the office of legal counsel from the audience, that is. The executive branch has the office of legal counsel that renders opinions on the legality and constitutional of congre excuse me, on the legality, constitutionality of congressional access to information. Congress does not have an office that does that other than in the context of legal action or a lawsuit. Should Congress, do you think Congress would benefit, if you want to express an opinion, on having an office that functions like the office of the White House counsel, however, in the legislative sphere? With respect to congressional oversight Correct. issues in particular? Correct. Well, I think practically, they, both chambers do have that function. And I've certainly had conversations with um, either House legal counsel or the Senate legal counsel around issues of dispute about congressional oversight and what's appropriate for Congress to request. Um, and you know that's part of the accommodation process. Again, I'm not talking about committee counsel. I'm actually talking about you know Senate legal counsel coming in and advising senators, yes, your request is legitimate or you know, of course the, as Don said, I mean the Senate legal counsel takes the same view about the Senate's authorities as we do about the president's <laughs> authorities, which is, a very expansive perspective, right? Senate legal counsel is going to take the view that um, the Senate is essentially entitled to virtually, you know, every document that exists within the executive branch if it's pertinent to something they're looking at. But but I do think that 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 does exist, if not formalized in the way that OLC exists. Don, Don? Uh, no, no. Here's why. Um, the House is 435 members. The Senate's 100 members. They all have a vote. Uh, they all bring to the table their own uh, desire to represent their constituents and uphold their own oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution. The executive branch is, is the executive, so it makes sense to have more of a centralized legal decision advice mechanism there because the executive power flows from the president, whereas the legislature, it's much more dispersed. So the idea of having kind of an office of legal counsel for the House or Senate, I think, would run into 435 buzzsaws and 100 buzzsaws on a daily basis, and it would just be unworkable. Um, plus, there's plenty of lawyers in the House and Senate. Speaker has counsel, majority leader has counsel, minority leaders have counsel. And they do it of a committee system. Committees have councils, the councils have views. And when you deal with Congress from the executive branch point of view, your first intersection is much more going to be with counsel to the particular committee that thinks there's jurisdiction over the issue that it's, it's coming, not the counsel to the House. That usually tends to be somebody who gets involved much later in the process, um, or unless you, unless you know that person's views, you get, maybe you want to get them involved sooner. And there's, there's ways to sort of navigate that where you, you, you pick your lawyer um, on who, who you think gets the better answer, if you're representing the executive branch, that is. But I think, I think the idea of an office of legal counsel for the House or Senate 
it just doesn't work. I think they've developed their own system over a couple hundred years where they have their committee system, uh, and you know that that's just the way it's done. I think it'd be just if we were starting over and it were 200 years ago, maybe, but today, just uh, it, I don't think it's workable at all. Okay, very good. Well, I have uh, I have two additional questions I want to ask before our time runs out, and Senator Lee is here, and I want to ask you as the last question, what question you want me to ask Senator Lee when he's completed his presentation. But first of all, do you think the White House Counsel should be subject to Senate confirmation? Kathy? Absolutely not. Don? No. <laughs> Having gone through Senate confirmation and being Senate confirmed and have that, no, it's a different role. Um, I think that that puts uh, yet another layer uh, between the president and the president's ability to get candidate advice from advisors that he picks. I don't think the Senate has a say in who the president has as his inner circle. I don't think, you know, law clerks to the chief justice need Senate confirmation either. I don't think uh, counsel to the Speaker of the House needs to, uh, you know, be interviewed by the personnel department and the executive branch. I think it sounds in separation of powers. I think the president's entitled to his sort of core group of advisors and not uh, advisors that are picked by another branch of government. Kathy, same I agree. reasoning? Absolutely. Okay. Um, last question I want to ask from the group of questions here from the audience. What is the role of the White House Counsel in addressing leaks inside the executive branch? So there was a, Kathy, you opened up the answer to the national security question by talking about the problem presidents face in sharing information with Congress, building a partnership around national security issues because of the risk of leaks. But obviously we have a significant issue of leaks within the executive branch. Some of these leaks are for purposes of course of, when I say of course, but I think it's understood in some cases they're for the purpose of um, waging intra-branch battles in which one side uses a leak to try to win an argument with another side within the executive branch sometimes for the purpose of pushing information out to the press for a variety of reasons. But clearly, um, not all of the leaking that creates the tensions between the two branches are a fault of the legislative branch. And yet, leak investigations are extremely controversial. Any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm riffing a little bit on the question, but I think this is roughly the idea. Well, I think every White House would like to uh, uh, prevent leaks from the White House or from the administration. And the, and the reason is that um, leaks tend to um, affect presidential decision making in a way that can undermine the integrity of that decision making. In other words, um, let's say a president is contemplating a particular decision, not, not even anything that you know is not a national security decision, but just um, even a, 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 pres a personnel appointment. President is deciding, you know, who to appoint to be the chair of the Federal Reserve, and um, there are people within the White House who have different views about who that appointment should be. And somebody decides that they're going to actually put their thumb on the scale in favor of their candidate, and so they leak um, to some to to the press or to a constituency group that is um, also opposed to the rival candidate, and therefore create a big brouhaha in the public before the president has even had the opportunity to make a decision, and um, therefore uh, affecting the president, potentially affecting the president's decision making as to who he, think the right, who he thinks the right candidate is, and to control the rollout of, um, the rollout of that decision, how that decision is, is announced and, and, um, and, and kind of messaged, if you will, to the public. So, uh, I think every White House counsel is concerned about leaks within the White House for that reason. Um, at least that's a main reason. And so um, therefore has probably on occasion done some kind of internal review, internal investigation. It's not an investigation in the way we think about criminal investigations, but trying to figure out, well, who leaked it? And why did, why did they do it? And what was their motivation? Because it's, it, that was not helpful to the president. So uh, um, that, I think, is, is general. I think typically um, that kind of falls in the lap of a White House counsel. The White House counsel tends to be the, um, uh, what's the right word? You know, kind of the, the person who has to d 
deal with that kind of crap, <laughs> for lack of a better way right. to put it. By default. Yeah, by default. No one else wants to do it. It does not make you a popular person, um, for sure, when you say, oh, by the way, we're going to start looking through everybody's emails to see who talked to this particular um, you know, Associated Press reporter, whatever. But, uh, but you know, sometimes it has to happen, and, um, and I think, you know, does, does happen. With respect to leaks across the, you know, the executive branch, it's just a part of governing. I think um, there's not much that, that uh, a White House counsel can do other than to, through um, his or her channels of communications, to talk about, you know, the importance of um, giving the senior decision makers that decision space and it's just not fair and it's not um, frankly consistent with their fiduciary obligations to a particular administration to be acting on their own and leaking things out and so you know kind of moral suasion I think the White House counsel oft often also has to take on that role and convincing trying to convince people not to leak but it's not gonna I mean it's just it's a fact of life it's a fact of life um, loose lips sink ships, right? Um, I, it, the one thing you said really rings true, and the way I thought of it is White House Counsel's Office is not an investigatory office, and we don't really have the resources uh, or sort of the authority to go around and formally investigate things. We review things, and I think, I think what the Counsel's Office does is, is issue spot and, and help determine whether uh, whether a particular leak requires additional legal action, a referral, or whatnot. Um, but, you know, when it comes to leaks, it's really a team effort. You know, Chief of Staff, Deputy for Ops, National Security side, all these folks uh, have to really work together to, to figure it out. And, and when you end up in situations of the sort you mentioned where there's sort of an infight, usually a lot of some of these leaks are because there's a policy spat and people want to try to, you know, use the papers to help decide the issue. Um, you know, that gets tricky because then, you know, who, know, who knows who's actually leaking. And if, if certain certain level of, of, of uh, senior staff strata approve it, is that now a leak? You know, it, it, it becomes this kind of odd thing. Um, you know, again, I, I go, but you, you, you only know what you know because of where you come from. And, you know, on Capitol Hill, it's, it's, it, you don't even really consider it a leak anymore. I mean, it just happens. You have these meetings and it's in the paper uh, before the meeting's even over. Uh, so <laughs> it's unfortunate because when you get in that situation, it's tough to be candid. It's tough. Everything then is scripted. You have to have a pre-meeting for the meeting. And now you need a pre-meeting for the pre-meeting for the meeting. Um, so when you actually have staff meetings, they're not even, even staff level, they're not really real meetings. Then you end up having the real meeting, the real and, meeting and then the fake meeting. Right. And Kabuki theater without the makeup, right? It, Everybody it, yes. sort of knows their lines, comes in and says it, and then you know somebody in the room is going to put it in the paper, so you better, you know, use full sentences. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that, I think I'm going to close it down. I guess I'll convey your regards to Senator Lee, who's about to start. If there's anything you want me to convey to him, let me know. You can hand, hand it anonymously on one of these note cards. <laughs> ask him who he thinks the best White House counsel is. Let's get that going. Um, no, I would ask him. I would ask him some variant of question about um, all these various uh, internal Senate procedures that that uh, sort of enhance the Senate's power potentially at the ex at the expense of the House or the executive. Blue slip among them. That's um, a great question. As as you know, because look. The, the, Blue slip in particular, there, you know, Canada still has this, the idea of legislative prerogative where one member can shut down the whole operation. That was discussed at the founding and rejected. So actually you can go back, you know, but this is the thing about when you get into separation of powers kind of constitutional law, you can usually find a precedent for almost any proposition one wants to throw at a cocktail party. Right. Um, but, you know, I, it's, you know hit, him, hit him with sort of this, this you know, this idea the Senate prerogative kind of thing, um, and that probably warms him up. I will, I said hi. I'll be sure to say Don and Kathy sent me. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.